So this is a joint work with uh, two PhD students, Tefka Asenova and Shuang Hu. And Zhuo Changpeng is the PhD supervisor of Shuang Hu at the Southwest University in China. So Stefka is on the right, on the left, uh, Shuang is on the right. Um, the maps are not drawn on the same scale. Right. This plot has been taken from a great article um, appeared in 2015 in the Annals of Applied Statistics, showing you a part of the Danube River. You see dots on the map. The dots they represent locations where there are measurements of water of water levels. Um, actually, so of the amount of water that flows uh, at that point per uh, second. And the question is now, suppose that at each of those locations you have a dike of a certain height, then what is the probability that at some point something will go wrong in a given year? So the uh, question is, well, what is the probability that in a given year there will be an exceedance of one of those levels at one of those locations? So this is a very typical question in extreme value analysis. So a typical question could be indeed, what is the probability that um, a certain level is exceeded? Or you may also ask the reverse a question. Suppose I give you a certain probability, let's say a, a, a risk margin, then how high should you build the dike so that the probability that the dike will be exceeded uh, will be sufficiently low? Now, this would be fine if we would have millions of years of data, but this is probably not the case, and probably the horizon over you would like to do such dike building will be longer than the record of observations you have so far and so the question will be how to extrapolate what you have seen so far into higher higher levels and of particular interest is here that we're not just inter that we're not just interested at the height at one given location but that we have a whole network of locations and of course if there is a lot of water at location a it's not unlikely that there also will be a lot of water at location B. So we are interested in dependence be be between such extreme. The framework I will be assuming here is a very classical one. Um, it's based upon the notion of max domain of, of action. So suppose we have independent copies um, of a random vector X in dimension D. And M will denote the vector of component-wise maximum. So for each component J, I calculate the maximum of all the random variables in the sample. And then the, the central assumption is a kind of a central limit theorem for maxima. That is, you assume the existence of sequences, scaling sequences A and location sequences B, so that those component-wise maxima, after rescaling, that they converge weakly to a certain distribution. Now, of course, the word central limit theorem here is perhaps not well chosen because G is certainly not Gaussian, but still G is the traditional notation for this type of distributions. G is a what's called a multivariate extreme value dis distribution, and if maxima from F, random samples from F, converge weakly, to G, we say that F is in the maximal domain of attraction of G. So there will not be many abbreviations in this talk, uh, but MEVD is an abbreviation you may encounter from time to time, so that's perhaps one you may want to keep in mind. Multivariate extreme value distribution, G. Okay, so, and, and why is, is this assumption useful for answering the problem I set out at the beginning? Well, the idea is now that tails of X can be approximated by tails of G. So even though we started with this perhaps strange notion of component-wise maxima um, over large samples, even the tail of a single, or the multivariate tail of a single observation, you can approximate by the tail of the multivariate extreme value distribution. So the probability of interest there is at least one exceedance in one of the coordinates. You can then approximate by taking the logarithm of the mean value distri distribution. So the idea is now that, um, and this is a 
classical idea. You estimate G based on the basis of your available extreme data, so what you have seen so far in the region so far. And once you have fitted G, then you use that one to extrapolate beyond what you have seen so far. Now there exist multiple paradigms here. You can either work with component-wise maxima, as I've just shown in this so-called central limit theorem, but of course you could also do this based on exceedances over high thresholds themselves, the so-called peaks over thresholds method. Um, but this, uh, but this, uh, essentially, they fall into the same idea. You use a invariance principle, a limiting invariance principle, to postulate a family of distributions, and then you use those dis distributions to extrapolate in, like, into high scale regions. However, danger, danger, this extrapolation step is very sensitive to model assumptions. So you could think of it as a very strong prior in a Bayesian sense. Since you're going to extrapolate at some point, it's like a leap of faith that what you've seen so far will continue to be the case at even more extreme levels. And since you will extrapolate into regions where you have no data, the role of assumptions will be quite important. And so this is why care has to be taken to the assumptions that one puts in addition on this extreme value distribution G. Okay, so then if, if that's the classical paradigm, let's have a closer look at those extreme value distributions. The usual way to, des to describe them is by splitting margins from dependence. And the margins they are fairly easy in the sense that they form a three parameter parametric family indexed by a shape parameter that says how heavy the tail is and a location and scale parameter mu at six. And so, insofar as statistics go, this is just a three parameter parametric family. It's a smooth, it's a more or less smooth family. So, this is not too, this is not too hard. Complicated, though, is the dependency structure, because in contrast to the margins for the dependency structure, there is no single parametric family that will describe all extreme value distributions. So this is a, a non-parametric shape-constrained family of dependency structures. There exist multiple ways to describe it. Uh, there is the exponent measure. Some people like the spectral or the angular measure, not, not, not to be confused with the uh, spectral distribution and time series analysis. Some other people like the stable tail dependence function. There were more. There was tail copula, the Pickens dependence function. And I believe uh, uh, after the break that Kirsten will focus on the exponent measure I read in your abstract. So we'll learn more about the exponent measure. Okay, so the details here are not important. What's important is that this dependence structure is not particularly easy to describe. especially not in high dimensions. And this is why it makes sense to want to put additional model assumptions to facilitate this task of describing deep patterns. Um, so this is a difficult task. We'd like to put additional restrictions, but how to do this given the fact that, recall, any model assumptions you make may have a big impact when you extrapolate. So if you put extra restrictions in order to simplify the task a bit, you'd like to make sure that you incorporate information that is somehow statistically relevant for your uh, problem. You would like your model to be not too complicated, so you would like to have a parsimonious model, but not too rigid either, so it should at the same time be uh, flexible. Once you have the model, hopefully you can actually so hopefully you can actually calculate and estimate things. And as I said already, take care of the implications for the extrapolations. So where will additional assumptions to simplify modeling the dependent structure of G, where will they come from? And what I would like to advocate here is what I call a bottom-up 
recall that the EVA paradigm is that, or one possible paradigm, it's certainly not the only one in extreme value analysis, um, is to model the tail of distribution with multi extreme value distribution G. And now what I, what I advocate is that if you input additional conditions on G, that ideally they should be motivated by properties that you think that the underlying process has. So suppose for some reason you believe it's reasonable to assume that the underlying random vector of interest that it satisfies one or more properties. So it could be a stationary process in time in time series analysis. There could be some exchangeability, there could be conditional independence relations, there could be stochastic ordering relations, anything you think makes sense to impose on your observable random. And how do these properties translate to the tail of F and hence to the invalid distribution G to which F is what I call a bottom-up approach because you pull the assumptions from, let's say, the, the origins where G actually comes from. And then, well, if, if you think that this is a sensible way to proceed, and this actually provides a template for research a, a program. Start out from random vectors that have a certain property, call a certain property A, and you wonder now if then X is in the domain of attraction of a multivariate value distribution, then what will be the property that G has? And it may not necessarily be the same a property. So property A for F will not necessarily be property A for G2. It may become a, a different and then, well, this somehow then motivates the study of invalid distributions with property B, because this property B seems to be somehow relevant. So you may want to study particular properties of such invalid distributions. And then, well, if you're happy with this family, you think you can work, uh, you can work with this assumption, and you can actually develop statistical methodology within this class of um, extreme value distributions with property. So this is, let's say, the underlying philosophy that I'd like to advocate. But then what's in, in, in this talk or in this, this work, what is then this underlying principle for the random vector X? Well, it's based on conditional independence the relations. And again, we'll have more on conditional independence in Kirsten's talk after the break. So essentially, we will be assuming that variables can be grouped in such a way that the variables in set A and variables in set B will be conditionally independent given the outcomes in set C, variables in set C. I wrote it in an abstract way using random vectors. Um, in case there are densities, then a, sufficient con then a sufficient condition will be that the conditional density of A, B given C, that it's that it factorizes into the product of conditional sets. But this should hold for triples of sets of subsets A, B, C. Where do these triples come, come from? Well, typically they are determined by a graph. So where the vertices are just the indices 1 up to D, and then a certain um, set of uh, uh, edges. So this brings us into the world of probabilistic graphical models. Um, I know of two large varieties of probabilistic graphical models. You have the Bayesian networks, which are directed acyclic graphs, and then triples A, B, C. You find them when um, nodes are so-called de-separated. An example is in a directed graph, um, children will be conditionally independent given their effect. So once you know what the parents are, given that information, the children will be conditionally in. This talk, however, will be on another class of probabilistic graphical models, the so-called Markov random fields. There we have un undirected graphs, and then nodes will be, or variables will be conditionally independent if there is a suitable notion of a separation within the group, and there will be pictures. The 
this bottom-up approach is to be contrasted with the top-down approach. You could, for instance, now assume that, well, G itself is a probabilistic graphical model. If this is what you assume, then you're in for a bad surprise. And this is the last time, Kirsten, I will, I will <laughs> stalk, stalk you here in this, in this stalk. Um, turns out that if G is absolutely continuous with a positive density, and if you would for G, so now if X would follow an extreme value distribution G, then the conditional independence actually implies full independence. So for extreme value distributions, there is, with, with densities, there is no useful notion of conditional independence. So this is a case where, prop, where property A and property B are not the same. Now, this does not need to stop you from assuming conditional independence with an extreme value distribution G, but then you're bound to work with distributions G that have no density, so they should be singular. And again, so the lesson that we learned from this is that if we think that our observable random vector X follows a probabilistic graphical model, then the extreme value distribution G to which it is attracted does not necessarily need to follow the same. And then the question is, but what property does G then may have instead? This is what this talk is. So the program then will be, we start with the mark of random field with respect to a certain graph. We look for extreme value distributions G that they are attracted to, that maxima are attracted to. This gives us class, a subclass of multivariate value distributions um, of which we study the properties and then we develop the particular methodology for this particular class of extreme value. So that's, that's the I now, this is an ambitious program, and so far we certainly did not cover all possible mark of random fields. We only got so far as to the very simplest ones, trees or block graphs. And again, I will show you pictures of tree and block graphs in slides. Okay. So, yeah, once, once more. So, our object is to model a modeling extreme value distribution G. Um, and this by studying extreme of mark of trees, or those are mark of random fields with respect to a tree, or their equivalent also mark of fields with respect to a block. And this idea by approximating or modeling a multivariate distribution by a mark of tree, it's actually not new. Um, it dates back to an old paper, 68, and it's been revived in the machine learning, the Coppola literature, and this is somehow how we got the idea of, of um, finding mark of three approximations to high dimensional distance. So explaining what is mark of three, how can it be used, and how to do it. Okay. So this was a long introduction, but I thought it was important in order to give you a context, because now what's going to come will be a little bit less fun. It will be some hard limit theorems, but at least now you know why the limit so why that's the type of theorems that we are pers pursuing. Okay. So I talked about the simplification or the distinction between margins and dependent structure in order to make this, this operational, it is convenient to standardize margins. Um, people who have seen talks of me before know that I typically will standardize the unit Pareto distribution. For this talk, I thought it would be an, in an interesting intellectual exercise to choose a different marginal distribution or standardization. And um, I chose the unit exponential one, and I was actually pleasantly surprised by, by how nice the formulas came out. So perhaps in a future paper, I will do the unit exponential distribution as a choice for but so, so other choices could be the standard uniform or the unit Pareto. Um, so that gives me the x tildes. Uh, we'll be considering their component-wise maxima. So now the normalizing sequences are very easy. You don't need to scale, and you just need to shift the location by the sample size itself. And the limit extreme value distribution g very conveniently will have support over the whole real line. 
and it will be the famous Gumbel distribution. Um, and so the G that we started with and this new G tilde, they have different margin, but they have the same copula or the same dependency structure. And so this is what's of interest to us. Now, you don't want to have to look to tildes for the remainder of the slides. I don't want to have to type tildes for the remainder of the slides. So from now on, I'm going to omit the tildes. But so think of now X being standardized to exponential margins and G to have to come. Right. So the first job will be to determine limits, so between value limits G of X following certain probabilistic graphical. So I started out with the central limit theorem for maxima. However, this turns out not to be the most convenient form of limit theorem, certainly not when you're dealing with conditional independence, so you need to condition on a certain variable, and these block maxima are a bit awkward to work. Different but equivalent form of limit theorem is in the so-called peaks over threshold approach. So what you do is you take a high threshold T, so T always will stand here for a threshold, tending to, inf to infinity, and you assume that at least one of the variables exceeds this high threshold. Then you, again, you relocalize all the variables by T, and you look for the limit. And this turns out to exist. It's called the multivariate generalized Burrito distribution, introduced by Holger Hutzin and Nat Pidi in Nudi. So the two forms are equivalent. You can pass from G to H, you can pass from H to G. Exact transformation formulas are not important here. So what's important is the principle that we pass from block maxima to peaks over threshold. Now, even this form is not totally convenient. So to assume that somewhere one of the variables exceeds the high threshold, it's much more convenient to condition exactly on a particular variable to um, exceed the large uh, threshold. And this turns out to be equivalent as, as well. So in, in orange, what has happened is that the conditioning event, at least one variable exceeds a high threshold, uh, has been changed to a particular variable, um, variable number u exceeds a high uh, threshold. So what you then find is a conditional version of this multi-regionalized brief. So this already will be more convenient um, when studying probabilistic graphical models. But it's still not quite what we, what we want. So here I repeated the same formula as on the previous slide. So we condition on a particular variable to exceed the high threshold, and we, risk, we relocalize the, the other ones, and we look for the limit. Um, it's more convenient, actually, now when we auto-normalize the process. So rather than subtracting the threshold t, we subtract the actual value of the variable that we conditioned upon. And you can imagine that in the Markov context, if you now condition on xu, then subtracting xu may be more practical than, than subtracting. Okay, and so this distribution of this limit vector a, so this limit vector a will appear in later slides. <laughs> Its distribution, again, is determined by the distribution of this conditional version of the multivariate generalized Brita distribution A. Again, the transformation formulas are not important here. It's just the principle that counts. But still, this is not exactly what we would like. Now, a sufficient, not necessary, but a convenient sufficient assumption is that you actually condition on xu to be equal to t. So rather than saying xu exceeds a high threshold t, you assume that it is equal to a large value, and then so, and since now x u is equal to t, you can then um, again replace the purple x u in the normalization again. So this last form, that's the type of limit theorems that we will be on. So you have your random vector, you pick a particular coordinate, you assume that at that coordinate you hit a large value, t, T tends to, inf to infinity. You rescale the whole vector by T, and you look for what does the limit 
And so via certain transfer, transformation formulas, they are a bit complicated. It's a bit of, of, of machinery. You can then go back from the limit vector A to the generalized pre-traver to the generalized pre distribution H and to the ultravertical stream value distribution G. So that's the principle. Okay. So this is the type of limit theorems that we will be after in the context now of Markov random. So now finally, what is a Markov random field? We have our random variables x indexed here by v, the v of the vertices of the graph. We have an un undirected graph with edges e. And but the Markov property is that if you have subsets of indices a, b, c, such that within the graph g, c separates a from b, then x a and x b are conditionally independent given x c. And so I suppose a picture tells more than 1,000 words. So here we have a very simple graph on six nodes. The set A is in magenta, the set B is in orange, and the set C is in blue. And you see indeed that if you would like to travel, let's say on a, a subway uh, map, you would like to travel from a station in the pink zone to a station in the, in the orange zone, you would always have to pass by the station in the blue. So blue separates magenta from, from orange. And so as soon as this is the case, we have conditional independence uh, uh, between XA and XB given C. Okay. Well, a particular type of Markov random field we all know is a Markov chain. So that's a very simple graph. It's like a chain graph. We just have a single branch. It's the easiest type of connected graph you can think of. And indeed, we all know that well, the past and the future are conditionally independent given the present. That's exactly this notion of conditional independence induced by this chain graph. Since x1 and x3 are conditionally independent given x2 because x2 separates x1 and x3 in the so Suppose we have such a Markov chain, then how do extremes from such a Markov chain, how do they look? And this is a famous result going back to Richard Smith, 1992. Um, for simplicity, I wrote it down for the four-dimensional case, but of course it extends to the d-dimensional case, but four was just just the right number for the formula to become clear. So we assume that we start, we set off the chain in motion at a large value t. And we look what happens with the remainder of the chain. So how does this large value, how does this impact the remainder of the chain? So this limit random vector, I call it A, it's indexed by one in order to recall that the, the starting value, it's at, at one that the large value occurred, but it's itself a random vector. So here with components two, three, and four. And those components, actually, they are the partial sums of, a, of independent increments M, so M of, of Markov, say. So in order to go from one to two, add an increment M12. And then in order to continue to two to three, you add another increment M23. To continue to four, you add another independent increment m three four. Okay, so those increments, they're independent random variables, uh, real value, possibly also minus infinity. So think of minus infinity as an absorbing state. Once you hit minus infinity, chain stays at minus infinity, and and you will uh, so let's say the impact of the extreme value at the starting point has ceased. And the nice thing is that those increments, their distributions, are determined by the Markov kernel, by the, the position curve. So this means that once you know, uh, so here the chain does not need to be a, a, homo a homogeneous chain, so you have different kernels at each pair. But once you know somehow the tail of each kernel, in the sense described in the second bullet, bullet point, then actually it's sufficient to concatenate, to, to, add, in, to, add, in, to add independent in, in, in increments to form this, what's called the, the tail chain. So famous, uh, famous uh, result by uh, Richard Smith. Oh, how am I doing on time? I'm five minutes left. That's gonna be ambitious, okay. Um, 
right? So at least I'd like to show you the limit theorems here. Yeah, okay. So now suppose you don't have a chain, but you have a Markov tree. Well, you can think of a Markov tree like lots of Markov chains that are tied together with common pieces, right? So paths, we have no cycles. And again, uh, so we have the Markov property. And the question is again, so how do weak limits look? You condition at a certain node, you can pick one, x1 or x2. You have a large value, then what is the impact of this large value on um, on the other variables? So x u is equal to t. You subtract t from the other variables, and what's the impact on? Okay. And um, the theorem now goes well. You again have convergence of those of this re-normalized re Markov tree to a random vector A. Distribution depends on the starting node U. And each, each element, each component in this limiting random vector A is a partial sum. A partial sum, again, of, of, um, of increments. And these increments, again, are independent increments. And their distributions are determined by the pairwise distributions um, a, B. So for, for, for edges A, um, perhaps the picture makes it clear. So suppose we have here a Markov tree with the seven nodes. And voila, we choose a starting node. We choose number four, the one in red. And what is A for seven? So that would be if you have a large value at four, what's the distribution at number seven? So this will be a sum of independent increments. Where do the increments come from? You go, so you travel in the tree along the path from four to from from, from four to seven. So that's that's the idea. The idea. Um, yeah, this is you like a transformation formula. How does then the associated extreme value distribution G look like. So the formula is meant to show you that you can make the link back. Looks a bit scary, but it's, it's explicit. It can be calculated. So not, not very important here exactly what this formula is. What's important though here is that it implies that you can now build extreme value distributions by any choice of the pairwise distributions. And so you have your graph. On each edge, you put an increment. You have almost no restrictions on how to choose distribution of that in, of that increment m, and then you combine them into this formula, and you get a valid um, extreme value. The m's would be Gaussian, a reasonable choice. You would find certain pistorized extreme value distributions. So now there is no point in rushing through all the slides. So what was more, and it will be for next time I have the opportunity to give a talk, is that the same thing essentially holds for block graphs. So there you replace edges by complete graphs or blocks. And again, your tail chain, let's say, will be determined by paths within the uh, so again, sum of independent increments um, over the tree. Okay. I'm rushing through certain things. So there was an example. And then what Schwang's work has been essentially now is how to transfer these limit theorems to statistical methodology. You have an extreme value distribution G. You try to approximate it by a tree structured version in order to simplify handling it. So you construct a Markov tree. This Markov tree itself, as, as we know, will not be an extreme value distribution, but the, this domain of attraction will imply that it converges or that its, that its extremes are attracted by a tree structure um, extreme value distribution. So in the sense of the limit theorems that I just pro proposed, and then this um, extreme value distribution uh, GM will serve as say a reasonable hopefully a reasonable working model for g <laughs>
Um, voilà. So that brings me in one warp speed jump to the last slide. So we tried to, um, we proposed classical, or we work within the classical para, para, paradigm where extremes tails are approximated by multivariate value dis distributions. But they're difficult to work with, so we are study a particular sub subclass motivated by uh, Markov random. There are many. So, so this this is a this is a rich um, source of, of of research problems. Um, what I didn't notice, but what I should note is that at least for the Markov piece of the Husserl Rice case, it turns out that the resulting models are a special case of the um, extremal the graphical models a la, uh, a la Engelke and Hitz. So we are happy there to, con to con converge to the same type of structure. More things you could do is you could think of other type of graphs that uh, develop other upper metric models and so on. Thank you for your attention. So we have time uh, at least for questions. Maybe. So, Thomas, the microphone because uh, it's recorded. Yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. So, about your very last remark. Um, so, the, these Markov trees, they are not a subset of these models of uh, Hitz and Engelke. And so, what, what would be, I don't know, the, the difference or which are the Markov trees that would not be part of their, well, class of conditional independence models? Um, I think that in the absolutely continuous case, that they're actually the same. So the Markov trees that we find here are indeed um, a special case of the extremal graphical models, or so the limiting versions. Uh, we only proved this for the Husserl Rice, but I think it will be true in general. The theory that we propose here also applies to non-continuous models, but I believe that Kirsten has something to say about conditional independence in non-continuous models too, so perhaps yeah, in that sense, it's a special case. The perspective here is somehow different. So as I said in the beginning, it's motivated from the domain of attraction uh, framework, whereas I understood from Sebastian and Adrian's paper, it's more like a top-down top approach. We just impose the hammersley clifford model on the exponent measure density. But so the good news is that that turns out to be a fortunate thing to impose because it actually boils down to what you find also from the bottom-up approach. So you can see it like a convergence of two ways of looking at the same thing. They come to, to, to the same con con conclusion. So that's perhaps, I, I see it more like the two approaches, they fortify each other. They, they strengthen. Thanks a lot. So it was a very practical question. Uh, if we get back to the motivation you gave with the Danube, I was wondering somehow if there was a connection between the, the, the graph you get and the physical one you get on the river. Uh, are there any connections like uh, 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 points you can get with gauges and stuff like that and, and, and your graph? Well, it's a very good question, and, and the answer is, is, of course, yes, and this is why actually this example appeared in that paper and has appeared later on too. So it turns out that if you now apply tree searching algorithms on your data, because in practice you will have to learn the tree, that the tree that you find will actually very strongly resemble the actual tree. It's a bit more complicated because in the river network you have two types of dependence. You have the River distance dependence, so if you would have to take a boat, how far does it take you from A to B? 
but you also have spatial dependence that's the rain clouds they're not bound by the river they can just go straight in the air and so sometimes points that are far apart if you would go by both are still close if you go by plane so you see in practice a mixture of spatial dependence and river distance dependence Okay, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, so you started your research with chains to trees to block graphs. I was wondering what's next, the decomposable graphs. And the other thing is, um, so we had uh, worked uh, with various uh, people on uh, the tail chain, uh, uh, the time change formulas, and then for the trees, if we realize the root change formulas, is there something like a similar thing also in the block graph context? Um, so the first question was, yeah, yeah, so indeed, so I mentioned this, I think, at the, at the very end with uh, Manuel Henschel and Sebastian, uh, at least for the history of rice, we're thinking of decomposable and then perhaps also non-decomposable graphs. Would be interesting to see this in action for other models. Um, I think with density factorizations, it's it's doable. If you don't have densities, it will be more 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 awkward. Um, and then the other one, yeah. So the, the 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 time change formula that 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 you just mentioned, it's essentially what you see in this tail chain when you start from stationarity. So I mentioned in the, in the beginning, you start from structural assumption on X, and you see what's the implication on the limit. Now, the, the limiting extreme value distribution G will then also have a kind of a stationarity, but if you go to the generalized Pareto version, the conditioned version of it, that would be the, 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 the um, that, that would be the so-called spectral process that will then s satisfy this time change formula. So it's actually the, the B property. So when you start from A, what's the B going to be in the uh, limit? Um, yeah, for trees you have this this tree change formula. I, we we didn't think any anymore what it would be for for blocks. I I suppose you can always do such kind of transform transformation. This similar type of change of measure arguments. So uh, thanks again. <laughs> um, we are going.